All right. Although I am going to ask, I am going to ask, Mike, if you can hear me, I am going to ask that you turn your cameras off and that you turn your microphones off so that uh, I am going to ask that you turn your cameras off. And that you turn your microphones off. Someone doesn't know that their microphone's on. Let's see if we can find you that person. Someone doesn't know that their microphone's on. Let's see if we can find you. I think it's Luciana. Luciana, I can see your little things are working. All right. Everyone behave. Everyone behave <laughs> while turning the car around and we're going home. Right. <laughs> so we are at five o'clock. So right before I begin uh, Susan's presentation, I just, as you, if you've been a Nisi webinar viewer before, you know, we all, always have a special for people who participate in our webinars. And it's a little different this time because normally we would give 15% off. But um, we have Black Friday coming up, so we decided that we're going to go up to 20% off by using the coupon LIVE20SUSAN. You can take 20% off of any Nisi product that is available on our website by just putting LIVE20SUSAN into the coupon field uh, upon checkout. And not only can you get Nisi product, but you can also get, there's the timing. Timing's all off. There we go. Ooh, Up, yeah. to, it says 15% off. I believe that is going to be for 20% off as well. Um, we'll, 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 we'll see if that happens in chat real quick. And um I also want to rec I also want to mention, by the way, that um, I have nothing to show on this right now, but proudly, uh, my company is uh, also representing a product called Atoll. Atoll from Silence Corner is a product that attaches to your tripod, and instead of using an L bracket where you have to release and turn to vertical, it's actually an item that works like a tripod collar on a lens, although the tripod collar is on the body. So you can turn the body horizontal or vertical, and you can change lenses with the Atoll on. It's a uh, Kickstarter featured item. I don't know what that slide's about. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a uh, Kickstarter item that won a uh, several awards. And it's really pretty fabulous. And we're going to, something's going to happen here. I'm on. And hi, uh, guys. Jim, would you like me to show the video for the Atoll? That would be great. Just give me two seconds and I'll grab it. This is like a world premiere. Ooh, I love it. Did I get the popcorn ready. This, have I, Susan? <laughs> no. Okay. Yep. Hopefully, it's happening soon. All right, here you go, folks. The world premiere. Two minutes, and then we'll get into the uh, webinar.
Well, I know so what I'm you. asking for for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It was actually on Kickstarter, and uh, I saw that a few people mentioned that they um, that they had uh, been an early um, an early uh, investor into uh, Atoll, but. We are very lucky that we got we got the brand. And by the way, feel free to watch the video over and over again in in front of a cozy fire on a cold winter night. It that mm. the, <laughs> the shot of cognac will be just perfect. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, so you know about your coupon, you know about Explorer, you know about Atoll, and you know about Nisi. Now you need to know about Susan Magnano. So I'm going to let you take over, Susan. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful intro. I'm also going to share, since we're talking about everyone having discounts, I'm also offering you guys a discount on my upcoming workshops. So I'm going to post about that in the comments. So check it out. You can use discount code NISI. And uh, let's get started. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Hold while I do that. Great. Sharing. Everything look okay to you guys? Yes, Can it looks good. Yep. Great. All good. Awesome. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for joining me and for tuning in. I know it's a crazy Monday night and you all have lots of things to do. So thank you for sharing your evening with me. I have included a QR code here for you to take a picture of that will link to my new free ebook. Uh, it's a beginner's guide for light painting. And also I am offering a $50 uh, gift card for everyone who signs up for the ebook. They will also be entered into a running for the $50 gift card because it is the holiday. And I want you guys to go buy your Atolls and your uh, Nisi filters. So um, one of you lucky people who, uh, who shoot me an email today will also be entered in that that I'll get back to you soon. So um, if you guys want to follow me on Instagram, my Instagram handle is Susan underscore Magnano. And here's my website where you can learn about my upcoming workshops. So let's get started. I want to start off with my favorite quote by Ansel Adams. It's you don't just take photos, you make them. And well, last I checked, 55,000 photos were taken a second. Obviously, times have changed from when Ansel Adams was shooting, but how many of those photos were taken and how many of those photos were made? And how does one even make in a unique photo nowadays? Uh, we are going to discuss how to evolve from capturing what's right in front of you to creating a unique image by manipulating time. So today we're going to talk about getting creative with long exposures. So what is long exposures? Well, long exposure photography is a technique where you use a slow shutter speed to capture movement, motion, and time to create impact. Today, we're gonna to discuss how, when, and why to do long exposure photography. Why? Well, first, you can blur motion, you can create unique images, you can capture the passing of time, you could smooth water and enhance uh, reflections and also remove distracting elements. So these are all why. Why do I want to create a long exposure? These are some of the reasons to do it. Next, we're going to discuss how to create long exposures. We're going to talk about gear, settings, and filters. So first, let's talk about gear. I recommend using a DSLR, a mirrorless, uh, using wide to medium wide lenses because you want to kind of tell the whole story. I've been using an Explorer tripod and I highly recommend these. They're durable because I'm kind of aggressive with my equipment. They're sturdy and they're portable. So I bring in them all on all my adventures. So check out the Explorer tripod. And you know where it says L bracket? Forget that. We're not bringing the L bracket anymore. We're going to bring the Atoll. I just learned about it. It's going into my next presentation and it's going there onto my camera next. So um, an L bracket is similar to the Atoll where you're able to adjust the tripod vertically um, without having to um, put your tripod and your camera actually crooked. You just kind of flip it around, but it looks like it's even easier with this Atoll uh, adapter ring. So we'll have to look into that. When you're doing long exposure photography, I recommend using a remote trigger. And if you don't have one, a lot of the newer cameras 
have apps. So if you have a new Canon or a new Nikon, download the app and you can actually trigger the camera from your phone, which is awesome. So make sure you have your phone charged as well. But uh, it actually helps save you some money. And also you have your phone with you all the time. So why not use your phone? Oops, skipped over something. Next, we're going to talk about understanding settings. ISO, shutter speed, and aperture affect the amount of light that hits your sensor. Together, they make up the exposure triangle. And together is how we're going to understand how we actually create our photos. So how we do long exposure photography. So let's talk about how we're going to set up our, our, our exposure. First, we're going to set up our camera. We're on site. It's daytime. And we're going to start by shooting raw because we want to have the most information possible. Next, we're going to set up our remote trigger. If you don't have one, you're going to use your app. If you don't have that, you can even set up a two-second timer. And the reason for doing that is because you don't want to shake your camera uh, and, and create a little bit of motion blur. If, um, next, we're going to set up an ISO of 50 or 100, basically your base ISO. And the reason for that is we're trying to achieve a long exposure. So you want your sensor to be as sensitive as possible. So that's why we choose 50 or 100. And then we're going to use an aperture of f11 or f16, because think about it. If you're trying to extend your shutter speed, you need to have um, a very small hole um, of your aperture, so less and less light. So you're making actually a proper exposure by just extending your shutter speed. So it kind of works like the triangle. Remember the triangle? Lastly, beware of diffraction. Diffraction is when you stop down your lens to f16, f20, it starts to lose sharpness. So that is why we're going to talk about filters. So once you dial in your proper exposure of your shutter speed, you get all your settings together, you dial it in, you realize, hey, guess what? I can't do a long enough exposure. What do we do? We start investing in some long exposure gear, which is where Nisi comes in. I'm so grateful I met Jim at the Outsider Conference because he's opened up a whole new world for me. Um, your filters are incredible and I love them. So I'm a, I'm a, I love messing with time and I feel like filters are like give you the ability to have this superpower to do long exposures during the day you become like this super strength and um you're able to blur time and you're going to see it later on in my pictures but um by using an nd filter or neutral density filter you're able to restrict the amount of light going in your camera so you're able to extend your shutter speed there's different types of densities um that are referred to as stops of light and you can also um use um you can use a two stop, a six stop, a 10 stop, or even a 16 stops. And um, for every ND filter you have, and any stop of the ND filter you have, it halves the amount of light entering the camera. And when the light is half, to maintain the same speed, you need to double the amount of your shutter speed. So it's actually really simple. Um, we're gonna kind of dive into it as soon as we discuss the different type of filters there are. So first, polarizer. Polarizers are great. A lot of people use them for cutting out reflections. They also can remove a stop of light, which is great when you're not trying to do something super long, but it does help. Like let's say I'm at the ocean and I just want a little bit of movement in the water. Sure, I put on a polarizer, it gets rid of the glare on the ocean and it works out great. A lot of people will invest in a variable ND filter when they jump into filters because it makes sense. You can shoot at two stops to eight stops typically. Um, which on paper sounds fantastic. Who wouldn't want to be able to do that with one little simple dial? But what I've learned from variable ND filters is they're not the best for when you want to shoot at the maximum, like the eight stop. And I don't know about Nisi's variable ND filter. I never used it. I only know this from my students who bring them to my workshops. When it gets to be around eight stops, um, think about it as two polarizers turning in on each other. They get a, a weird X going through their photo. So I typically don't recommend variable ND filters. I recommend getting a solid screw on ND filter, like a solid 10 stop. And what 10 stop means is you're gonna be removing 10 stops of light, which is fantastic. So when you're shooting in the broad afternoon daylight, you can do up to 30 second exposure, which is enough to get some motion in the clouds, some motion in the water. Um, and, and I recommend a 10 stop over a six stop because I feel like a six stop isn't dark enough. Six stops are great during blue hour when it's already a little bit of dark dark uh, in your scene, but 10 stops is great if you wanted to use it in the middle of the afternoon. When you wanna go get really into doing long exposure photography like I do, 
I recommend just going all in and getting Nisi's ND Lawn Exposure Filter Kit. It comes with a 10 stop, a six stop, a three stop. It comes with the graduated filter. Um, yes, it does take a little bit longer to put on the ring, um, but the play, but like, honestly, we're all about slowing down here and making a shot, not just taking the shot. So um, you're able to create so many, so much more by having all these tools in your disposal. So take the time to put the grid on, put your filter in. You could even put your graduated filter in, which is useful when you're shooting sunsets and you have a bright sky and a dark foreground, you're able to balance the scene. So like these are the ultimate long exposure tools. So just wanted to kind of get you interested in that. If, if you don't, if you need more, uh, have any questions about it, please email me. I have my email address coming up here, Susan at Photor Adventures. If you have any questions, I can really help you dive into that. And I even do private lessons by people who just bought the filter and want to learn how to use it. So how to use the filter? We're going to go over this briefly. First, you find an epic composition that involves water or movement. You typically need something static and something moving around it. You set up your camera, your tripod, your trigger. Then you use autofocus to focus on your subject. And then you put it in manual because if you put it in manual, you're, manual, you're going to lock in your focus. And then from that point on, it won't have to search. Sometimes when you put the filter on, it'll keep searching for the focus or for your subject, and then it'll, you'll, you'll struggle. So put it in manual focus, you're locked in. You take a normal baseline exposure without the filter on first, so you understand what your settings are. And then you use an app like the NEC ND calculator or PhotoPills or one of these apps where it'll tell you what your exposures should be now that you put a 10 step on. You basically put in the calculator, these are my settings. I put a 10 stop filter on. Now this is what your shutter speed should be. Or you put on the filter and then you adjust your shutter speed to be the proper exposure and you look at your exposure meter. That's what I do. I kind of just put on the filter and then it says, hey, whoa, things just got super dark. And then I just open up my shutter speed till it gives me a proper exposure and then I go for it. So that's pretty much simple techniques on how to do that. Again, my email if you'd like to ask me any questions about gear. Moving on. Next, we're going to talk about the most exciting spot. Time, oh, sorry. But next, we're going to talk about the most exciting part is when to do long exposures. It's when you have a stationary subject with moving elements, like the clouds, the water. There could be cars, people, stars, or even when you want to do light painting. So this is the interesting part, guys. I'm going to warn you. Light painting, oh, sorry, long exposure and light painting is very addictive. So I warned you guys, once you put a filter on your camera and you start messing around with time, there's no turning back because every other picture after this is boring. You're just kind of walking up to a scene, taking a snapshot. When you're able to manipulate time with filters or by using low, low taking pictures in low light scenarios, you realize that creativity lies in your hands and in your fingertips. So we're going to start off with some photos. This is a picture of just a normal scene in Acadia. I do a lot of fall foliage workshops out here. You know, it's nice, got some good composition, but nothing is really catching my interest. It's a 200, one 200th of a second exposure. I put on a filter, I'm able to do 10 seconds, and I realize, wow, instantly it's like turned into a piece of art. It went from kind of a snapshot to a piece of art. And what I'm looking at here is the movement of the water crashing, the waves crashing on the on the um, on the rocks. Here's another example. In New York City, there's the Colgate clock and the view of Manhattan, and this is actually from New Jersey. You know, this is kind of a standard shot. I could walk up and take it with my iPhone, like hundreds of people do every day. Um, but I thought, what can I do to make this a Susan original? What can I do to make this my own? So again, I put on my 10 stop filter and I crank it up to 30 seconds. And what I love about this is, is the serenity. Now it tells the mood, it tells a story. The clouds are a little bit wispier, the water is a little smoother. And just like, look at the difference, you know, kind of average, and now we have a piece of art. Again, this is now actually shooting in low light. We're waiting, it's blue hour, we're waiting for the sun to rise. The city lights are still on, it's beautiful. It might not even be a great sunrise because there's so many clouds, but I'm there patiently waiting. I do 10 second exposure normal because I don't need a filter because it's already so dark, but I want to see what would happen if I was able to do a longer exposure. Would something magical happen? That's the question I always ask myself. 
I do. I'm able to do 30 second exposure. And you know what? I don't care for it. And that's a lesson I learned. I had to take that chance. I did a, put my six stop on because again, it was blue hour. I didn't need full 10 stops. And you know what? I think the clouds lost some of their texture and it just, the water looks the same smoothness, nothing really, I didn't gain anything. So I wanted to show you that not every picture is better with long exposure, but it's worth trying out because you never know what you're going to create. All right, guys, this is uh, my new favorite place in the world. It's called the Dolomites. It's the Italian Alps in Italy. And it's been fantastic. I was literally staying at a lodge and this was the view when you walked outside the door. The clouds were, um, were basically above the clouds, which is amazing. And I saw this scene, I was like, this is fantastic. I have my uh, object that's staying still, which is the mountaintop, and I have the clouds moving around it. So I put on my 10 stop filter. I took a, a second exposure, okay. Then I did a five second exposure. Okay, do you see what's happening here? The, the clouds are starting to move. And then I did a 10 second exposure. And each time, I just want you to also look at my settings, which I've included in the bottom. I'm stopping down my aperture because I'm making the shutter speed longer. If I just let my aperture be the same, the picture would overexpose. I can't lessen my ISO anymore because it's at my base ISO. So only thing I can do is smaller my aperture. So I'm cranking down my aperture. So now I'm at F16. I'm able to get a 10 second exposure. And then I went to F22 and I was able to get a 15 second exposure. And I actually love the way this look. I want you guys to see this comparison of how by using a 10 stop filter, I'm able to manipulate the clouds and the movement just by letting up my shutter speed, uh, shutter stay open long enough to get the movement. So I don't know, it's personal taste. Maybe some people like a little bit more detail in the clouds and some people like a little bit more movement. But for me as an artist, I just love experimenting. It's really actually the thrill of discovering in each picture. Like, I don't really know how it's going to look because the clouds might blow harder sometimes or, or less and it might be different. I, I just love the surprise. Here's also a common picture. People do uh, long exposures for waterfalls because you get that beautiful milky waterfall. One thing I learned here I wanted to share with you guys is uh, for this one, I took one second, one, uh, one, basically one and a half seconds. And this one, I took five seconds. The water looks identical because the speed of the water falling in the waterfall uh, was pretty fast. I didn't need to do a long exposure to get that movement. But the one thing that happened when I did go longer was I started to see the tree leaves blur. So be mindful that longer is not always better. You might get some unwanted camera blur, like unwanted leaves blurring. So, um, so pay attention. That's why I experiment and start off quick and work a little bit slower and see which one I like a little bit better. Here's kind of a typical scene. Sun is setting over the horizon, beautiful rocks in the water. I thought it was pretty good. I put on my filter and now there's a different mood, different serenity, like it's peaceful. I feel like this could be like, you know, I could put on some spa music and look at this picture. And this one kind of creates a little bit of agitation, but still beauty. So, I mean, just think about what you want to create. What do you want to visualize? What is your intentions? And I think that's something to think about. What are your intentions with these photos? So this is fall in Manhattan, Central Park, Boat Bridge, boaters going by every second. You know, this is kind of what you get. I thought it was fine, but I thought, how can I make this better? I put on my filter and the boaters disappeared. They kind of went through my frame. Thankfully, they didn't stop to take a selfie and you're able to get rid of distracting elements. Um, and, and I just love that, that filters allow you to get rid of distracting elements if you keep your shutter open long enough and the distracting element keeps moving. Yeah, it might create a little bit of a blur or something, but for the most part, it's not gonna be as distracting as it would have been as it was in this picture. taking another picture of just a lighthouse, you know, hey, that's cool. I love cloudy days like this because for me, I see these beautiful white puffy clouds, but then I also see this motion that I could create. And um, I was able to capture a little bit of motion. The clouds weren't moving that fast that day. You know, I didn't get that much motion, but it, it does become more interesting if you get a little bit of that blur. And maybe some people like the crisp look, but I kind of like that motion. Also, using filters and doing longer exposures, you're able to get 
better reflections. If there's like a little bit of ripples in the water, you're be able to enhance the reflections, which is really helpful when you're doing landscape photography. This was the perfect scenario. We have the World Trade Center tower, we have pylons in the water, like an old pier, and then we have the motion of both the sky and the water. It's like fantasy shot here. So what I'm looking for here is to do long enough exposure to get some movement in the clouds. And what I like to look at when I'm shooting cloudy scenes like this is to make sure I have that contrast of the white and the blue. You know, like if it was just all white clouds moving by, it actually wouldn't be that interesting. I had to wait for some blue sky to peek into the picture to get that movement. And the same thing with the water. You know, like I wait for, you know, I, I like to get a little bit of the ripples, but also keep a little bit of the texture too. Um, it really depends on my mood, I guess. Sometimes I like it glassy, sometimes I like it with texture. But that's, as an artist, your personal taste. Here is uh, Central Park again. And this is at the reservoir. And it was like lining up to be an epic sunset. When you walk up to the park and you see pink and purples in the sky, you're just like, this is going to be a good night. And I was able to do a, a two-second exposure. I thought that was pretty cool. It got darker. I did a 30-second exposure. And this is all without a filter because it was dark enough. This is blue hour. So, you know, I'd gotten my shot, but then I thought, what would it look like if I did a couple minute exposure? So what I did was I put my filter on my 10 stop. I did a two minute exposure and now I look like I'm in the matrix, which is cool. You know, uh, I was able to get a little bit better reflections um, and it's all about timing. You know, sometimes uh, the wind won't blur the water as much. Who knows? You know, and, and, and the clouds could blow. An important distinction is which way the clouds are blowing. So I personally think it's most interesting if the clouds are going away from you or um, away or, or like basically right in front of you or right behind you. If they're moving to the side, it's not as interesting, I don't think. You don't get as much uh, interest, but you kind of get that awesome, like going into a vortex look when they're going right over your head in front of you. So pay attention to the direction of the clouds, I think is important. Another beach scene, um, and I thought that was beautiful add a filter and we, and we get that motion we get that mood uh, this is an interesting shot i took i love the positioning of this tree i love the mountains the background and the clouds are great but they're moving so dang slow i did a 30 second exposure and they hardly even move so now i actually combined my 10 stop and my six stop to create a 16 stop filter um, and i experimented I did a six minute exposure and it was actually too blurred out. And then I, I kind of finalized on three minute exposure because I still had some detail in the clouds, but I was able to capture the, uh, the mood that I was trying to achieve. And thankfully the cloud branches didn't blur too much because there really was um, no wind hitting the, well, maybe there's probably some wind, but there was no leaves on the, on the tree to, to blur. So kind of an interesting use of, stacking your uh, your filters to do even longer than 30 second exposure during the middle of the day. All right, guys, we're gonna get to one of my favorite times of day, the blue hour. And the blue hour is 30 minutes before the sunrise or 30 minutes after the sunset. It's a great time to shoot because it's balanced light, it's soft, it's low contrast. The sky and the glow of the city lights, they kind of match and you're able to get beautiful color blue and the city lights. And this opportunity to capture car trails, cloud blur, water blur without filters. So now you can actually do all the things I was talking about naturally. A tip is to scout for the location during the day so you're prepared because blue hour goes by super quick. So this is a famous place in Dumbo, New York in Brooklyn, uh, overlooking Manhattan. A lot of people come here because again, it's the perfect scenario for a long exposure. You have the static city skyline and some pylons and water movement and the clouds if you're lucky. And, you know, I like a 15 second exposure to get a little bit of the clouds moving and, and the water kind of flattening out. I've shot this probably 25 times. I do workshops here all the time. And every time I challenge myself to shoot it a little bit differently to see if I like a, diff like a different effect. Sometimes I'll shoot it faster. Sometimes I'll shoot it even longer. And it all depends on the conditions. Sometimes it's cloudier. And, and it creates every time a different look and never get old in the spot. Now, same location, different, uh, different spot in Dumbo. 
But again, we're looking at the Manhattan skyline and I want you to think about intention. So here I did the standard. I did a 30 second exposure. I shot F16 because I wanted the lights on the bridge to look like starbursts. So because of that, I had to raise my ISO to 320. I had earlier said I, I normally shoot at 100 ISO, but again, now we're in blue hour. We need to have a proper exposure. And at F16 and 30 seconds, it was uh, too short of an exposure. Uh, that it wasn't a proper exposure. So I had to raise my ISO to 320, which is fine. I don't mind doing that. I need to get the proper exposure. Uh, alternatively, I could have done it on full mode and done a minute long exposure. Could have done that too. Um, so, you know, you just have to kind of work on your settings to decide what you're trying to achieve. Here, I did a 30 second exposure. I really liked the effect. And I want to show you on the opposite end of the schedule, uh, on, the, on the, the timing, I only did five seconds here. And you're saying, hey, Susan, why would you do that? Well, the reason was is because I love the texture in the sky. I learned that when I did a 30 second or longer, the clouds blurred too much. It looked pretty boring. It almost looks like really, really textured in the sky. So I wanted to keep that texture. So in order to do that, I shot five seconds. I wanted to keep the starburst in the bridge lights. So I kept that 14, but then I had to jack my eyes up to a thousand ISO. So remember we have to balance your, your exposure. And one last shot, this is 2.5 seconds. Again, this is a little bit earlier, a little bit more blue hour. I wanted to show you what it looks like when you shoot at 2.5, five seconds, 30 seconds, all different nights. You know, again, I wanted to keep the texture of the clouds in the sky because I thought it was really interesting. I think also maybe there was lightning this night and I was trying to catch lightning bolts. That could also be why I was shooting a little bit faster. But um, just to teach you guys, like, you don't always have to do long exposures. Look how interesting it is when you get the texture. You know, uh, for me, when I got my first 10 stop filter, everything I did was long exposures because I loved like seeing that effect. But I've, in, I've kind of taught myself, you know, it's not all about that. Let's, let's, um, let's see what it's like a little bit quicker with um different different effects another cool effect you can achieve is simplicity just by doing a long exposure i was able to get rid of all the ripples i was able to get rid of all the clouds and it's just such a simple interesting picture normally you'd walk up to this and be like so what it's a rock in a lake but now it's become artwork all right guys we're going to get into captioning motion does anyone have any questions before i jump into this i know that was a lot of uh, filter information. No. Nope. All right, great. We're going to jump into capturing motion. Um, now, these pictures I'm capturing, none of them are with filters. They're all because of low light. So this is actually I'm in Acadia National Park. If you couldn't tell, I'm photographing some birch trees on a wooded path, and it's dark. So I'm able to stop down my aperture and do a tenth of a second. And all I'm doing is a intentional camera movement where I pan the camera down, kind of just drop it. It's a real quick, one tenth of a second is super quick and I kind of just drop it. And it's so fun, the intentional camera movements, I can do it all day because each one's kind of unique and you really feel like an artist. You're like, oh, look at this, I'm, I'm, uh, I just made a Monet. Here's another uh, variety of doing the same thing, but instead of panning the camera down, I zoomed in. So again, that same kind of movement, someone's walking on the path ahead of me, I zoomed in, created this kind of vortex effect. Now this is at nighttime. So it's super easy to do this. I was able to do it for four seconds. I could have done it for 10 seconds. Um, when I'm doing um, like an intentional camera movement here, where I have a subject that's really identifiable, like the Pepsi Cola sign, a couple things to think about is the longer you hold the camera in one position, the more it's gonna burn into your image. So I kind of started with the camera at a wider angle and left it there for maybe two, three seconds and then zoomed out quickly at the end to get the Pepsi Cola sign blurring. Um, so the longer you hold it on your subject, the more it'll burn in and then the quicker you move the, uh, the zoom in or zoom in or pan, whatever effect you wanna do, the more it'll create that blurred effect. I love doing this. I do them um, zoom in, zoom out, left, right. Like it's just so fun because each picture is unique. So I recommend trying this technique. This is an interesting uh, opportunity. This is during a workshop I did in New York City. Um, this is inside the Hudson Yards and they, uh, for the holidays, they put all these beautiful Christmas lights 
on the staircase. And um, what's cool about it is if I'm on the escalator and my student is on the escalator and we're both moving at the same speed, uh, she's going to be sharp, but the background is going to be blurred. All the lights are looking like a blur. So like, think about the creativity of doing this. You know, I put my camera on a tripod really low, tried to be incognito. My students stood pretty still. And this was maybe like a three second exposure. Um, and, and we just captured the movement of the lights around her. So like anytime you think I'm on something steady, there's movement around me, what can I create here? I challenge you to see what that is. Car trails, amazing. Uh, important part when you're trying to do something is to line up the car trail so it S curves or C curves through your picture. Um, this was in Moab, Utah, uh, right before the sun was rising and I found this great road shot and I thought, okay, this would be cool. Another tip when you're doing car trails is to um, put it into volometer. So if you sneakily look in the picture, the car trail was actually longer than 25 seconds. The car actually took 50 seconds. So right when it hit 25 seconds, it's kind of right when it ran around that bur that that um, turn. And I had to click the camera again, and then it started up again. Can you notice it? Not really, but if you want it to be right afterwards, put it on intervalometer and put your intervalometer at one second. So as soon as it's done taking the picture, it starts the next one. So you try and get that continuous car trail through your picture if the road is long, longer than the amount of time that you can um, do. I couldn't have done a longer exposure here because it was too bright already. I couldn't put my filter on, but I don't know if the car lights would have been bright enough to be seen in the photo. Car trails are also really fun. You could get streaks like this one. This is in front of um, the uh, Oculus and the World Trade Center in New York City. I do a lot of workshops out here just to experiment with lights. And I think it's really fun. But what if you don't want it to look like a streak? So I want you guys to look at the difference here. So this is 30 seconds at 18, F18. And the reason why I think I did F18 was because I was trying to make the lights look like that starburst. Um, and here I wanted to get the shape of a taxi. So when I looked at a bunch of my pictures, I was trying to figure out what is the speed I need to capture a taxi. Honestly, I don't think there's a real, you know, formula. It depends on how fast the taxi is going. But I noticed that on a bunch of my pictures at one thirteenth of a second, I was able actually to get the taxis. Um, so you have to shoot super fast. So in order to do that, I just shoot at 8,000 ISO. So think about it. You've got to compromise some things. Um, to, to get something sharp enough, but capture a little bit of blur. So again, this is Times Square. It is super bright in Times Square. So I only had to shoot at ISO 320 to get a similar shot. So interesting, right? How the environment affects um, everything. Also think about vantage points. Car trails are great from the ground, but they're even better when you're at a high vantage point. And this is from my apartment in the city, such a cool view. And all I did was sit on my balcony and just watch the traffic go by. You know, um, think about getting unique vantage points and capturing motion. All right, guys, we're gonna get into my favorite subject, light painting. But is there any questions before we move on? No? Okay, great. Uh, moving on to light painting. So how do we light paint? First. Same thing, we're gonna expose for the background. We're gonna focus on a subject. We're gonna do a test shot and then we're gonna add lights. So what is light painting? Light painting is when you add light to your scene. There's a couple different varieties of light painting. One is where you light paint your subject from outside of your frame, which we'll show you in a second. And then there's some where you actually light paint in your frame. So we're gonna get into dive into those. So this is some of the gear that I use for light painting. A Luxley Fiddle is a great video light. That's a LED light, changes colors. Um, it even goes down to 1%, which you may be questioning, why would you want it to go to 1%? It's great for when you want to do um, low level lighting, which means that you leave your light on for the duration the duration of your photo. So here uh, I, was, I could do star trails and leave it on for the duration of the picture and it works out perfectly. It also changes from red to blue to green and all the colors in between. It's super great light. Luxley Fiddle, check it out. Speed light, awesome for freezing my models when I'm doing portraiture. Flashlights are necessary because I use them in a lot of my light painting tools, like this light guard that you see here. 
basically this is a plastic tube I get from Home Depot. It's called a T8 tube and it costs like $3. You stick your flashlight in and you instantly have a lightsaber. So guys, this is kind of like the basic kit that I use for the majority of my pictures. I do have some specialty items that I'll talk about when I get to a photo that features it. But I just kind of want to show you that most of you guys have these kind of tools already in your arsenal. You can start light painting right now. And the whole point of this, this kind of presentation is to inspire you to use the tools that you have to get out and do interesting things. So here's an example of light painting. And this is light painting from the side. I didn't put my light source in the scene. And a really important distinction whenever you're going to do light painting is the angle of light. So I always go from like a 45 to 90 degree angle. So it becomes like harsh and shadowy and you create texture. Also in this picture, I got really low on the sand to create those ripple effects. If I would have been right from behind the camera, it would have looked like flat, boring light. So really, really important distinction is to think about your angle of light. And for this one, first I did was exposed for the sky, basically, because it's all about the stars here. And then I added my light source. And if it was too bright, I dimmed it. Or I could have changed my setting. Um, but for this one, I would just dim the flashlight because everything else is properly exposed or dim the Luxley fiddle. As you can see, I'm also putting a little icon on the corner so you guys can see what tool I use. This is one of my favorite places to go, Mono Lake. It's in uh, California. I'm going to be doing a light painting workshop out there this year. And for this one, I use two lights. I use the Luxley fiddle to light paint that nearby uh, tufa. That's what they're called. And then I used a flashlight to light the, the tufas very far away. So if I hadn't done this, everything would have been in silhouette. I think it adds a lot of character. Remember when Ansel said, you don't make a photo, you don't take a photo, you make a photo. In this picture, I can honestly say, I made the photo. If I wasn't there, it just would have been a silhouetted picture. It would have just looked, you know, like a perfectly good silhouette. But now I'm adding my own flare, my own light. Another thing you can do when you're light painting is you can add color to your pictures. So cool thing about the Luxley Fiddle is it's warm. You can change it to be warm tones. So because I knew I had a very blue environment, I turned my Luxley Fiddle to be warm. And now it actually pops out of the frame. It's the juxtaposition of the cool tones and the, the warm tones that actually I'm using color as another element to my picture. So you'll notice I do that very often because why not? If we're going to add light, we might as well make it colorful. This is uh, adding light to what could just be a silhouetted tra uh, train in the middle of Death Valley. A beautiful starry night, adding a little bit of light. And again, I went 45 degrees or to 90 degrees to the front of the train and, and lit the train from the front. Any questions so far? We're going to move into light writing. Perfect. So with light writing, I kind of think of it as like graffiti. Now I'm actually incorporating the light into my pictures. So with this one, I just use a flashlight. This one is called the Old Light Warrior. And what I did was I drew on the sidewalk like it was a piece of chalk. And if I would have stood up and pointed it down, it would have looked like one big blob of light. So I actually was bent over and literally scraping the flashlight basically against the pavement. Did I have a sore back? Yes, I did. But was it worth it? Totally, because no one else has a sign that says, I love you in front of this scene. You know, I go to this scene all the time with workshops. What can I do that's different? This was one of my challenges. And this is what I did that was different. You know, add your own ideas. And, and what's great about this is you can't get arrested because there's nothing there once your picture's done. It's like a secret love letter to yourself that only you and your camera can see. Yeah, speaking of love letters, here's the heart. You know, here's this really cool uh, design, uh, weird cube in the middle of New York City. And I just walked up to it and I drew a heart on it. You know, just something unique. If you have some friends, you could do something interesting like trace their bodies. So this is also in, in uh, Central Park. This is my roommate. And what I thought would be interesting is if we just went around each other and traced each other with light. And as you could see, at one point I traced her and at another point she traced me. So you can actually see we're kind of opaque. You can see the rock wall behind us. If I had stood there the whole time, 
you wouldn't see that. So it's interesting to see how, uh, how that works. All right, guys, we're going to get into light painting portraits, which is my favorite. And I'm going to go step by step of how I created these scenes so you can get a really good understanding of how this was done. So first, we're going to start off by exposing for the background. So kind of blue hour shot. Um, then we're going to light up our background elements. So I thought it kind of looked flat. So what we did was we put the Luxley fiddle inside the, the truck and we made it warm. Again, playing with color. Then we added a model. We light painted her. We added a model and focused on her. Then we did some light painting. So here I use that tube. Remember how I said I stick a flashlight in the tube? And then I did a kind of a hurricane-like effect where it kind of started out with a big circle and worked my way down. And then I adjusted the brightness. Let's say the flashlight was too bright, I would dim the flashlight brightness. And then I experimented. And this is kind of what we what we worked up to. We kind of did a bunch of different scenes, but this was like a perfect circle, which uh, is a technique that I do where I stick my arm out and spin my uh, wrist and keep it like uh, it's perfectly pivoting like the center of a circle. Here's another night, another model, just to show you guys the difference. Um, the moon was out, so everything was completely different. The first night it was blue hour, but the, the, actually the, start, the moon never came out that night. It was a new moon. Here we had the moon out. It was completely different environments, just to show you the difference. Here we had to light everything or else it was dark. Here the moon was like creating great, beautiful ambient light. And we did light up a little bit from behind. But, um, and, and also I lit up the model. So here she was a silhouette. And here, I just wanna show you something different I do is I use my flash. So the way that I have these speed lights is I just hit the red button that turns red is a test button. So I actually don't keep it on a stand because it's annoying to, it's only in my way. I typically run through the frame and I flash the model and I run out of the frame. So I'm like a ninja, you don't see me because I didn't stay in the spot and no light hit me during the exposure. So in this spot, I flashed the model and moved out of the scene. And we also light painted, created that hurricane-like effect behind the model. So that's kind of that picture. I'm gonna talk you through another scene. First, we're gonna expose for the background. So we expose for the stars. Then we light up the house. So we did low level lighting where we kept the Luxley fiddle on for the majority of the time. We put it at like 3%. We turned it on red because we thought red was cool. And then we decided if we have a church, what do we need? We need a subject. So we had a couple. Uh, we put the couple in front of the church and we used a tube. Uh, the tube actually had a piece of green tape on the end. So that's how we got the green rim around it. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, uh, we, we did the tube, we did the inside. But for me, I want to say, what else can we do? So. We moved a couple outside of the doorway. We turned the church blue. And then we used a red tube with a tissue at the end, which caused it to be uh, white or, or gold uh, because it stopped the light from coming out. And we used a speed light. So instead of lighting our model from the front, we actually lit them from behind. And what we did was we powered it down real low and we hit the test button over and over and over and over and over again, flashing it back towards the camera. If you flash it back towards the camera and it's at a high power, because you can manually control it, I was at 1 one twenty eighth of the power, um, it would overexpose and blow out the picture. But if you keep it super low and you point it back towards the, ca the camera, you can create that fairy light effect, which I think is really cool. Here's one more uh, picture taken at this cool church. Uh, this is actually at Nelson Ghost Town in Las Vegas. I do light painting workshops here all the time. And it is fantastic place to go to because there's so many cool like structures. So that, that structure you just saw, the abandoned car, this church, we're gonna get to a crashed airplane. I mean, if you guys wanna learn how to light paint, come join me here because this is the spot to be. But again, this is actually the only composite of the whole um, presentation. First, I did a 45 minute exposure of the stars and I put that together. And later on, I, the moon rose. That's why there's so much light here. I did a picture of um, a couple inside of this church with a tube. And then again, we pointed the flashlight back and flashed it back towards the camera. So pretty cool, right? How you can do so many different things. And like what I like about light painting is you're basically starting with a blank canvas and you're adding in your own light. You're telling your own story. So again, we started off with exposing from the background, we lit up the background with purple and blue, because why not? Those are great colors. And then we added a model. 
And for this one, I want to share with you, I did a different type of tool I haven't talked about yet. It is a fiber optic tool from lightpaintingbrushers.com. It's just black fiber optics with a red gel. And when you shake it like this, it actually, only the tips glow, so it actually looks like fire. So I was able to light paint the model and use the, the, um, the fiber optic and just shake it around her and create that fire effect. You know, amazing how you can do so many different things. Another night, we had another model come and a different tool. It's called a light blade. It's featured on the top left-hand corner. This one's shaped like a leaf. You stick a flashlight in it, also from lightpaintingbrushers.com. And I used it by turning it on and off, on and off, on and off to create each one of those leaves. And I did it within 30 seconds. I was pretty impressed with myself. We had the constant light shining on the back of the um, of the um, airplane. And because I'm not really staying still and no light's really hitting me, the only light that's hitting me at the time is from the, um, the blade, but I'm not light lighting myself up. So that's why you don't see me. Susan. Moonlight. Yes. Just real quick, there is a que there's another question I'll ask you at the end, but sure. uh, Roseanne is asking, how are you choosing F4 and why? F4.5? Well, um, I think it was because I wanted to get a couple more things in focus. I wanted to get the plane in focus. I wanted to get the girl in focus. Um, I, I don't think it was also super dark. Uh, there was moonlight out this night. So actually that was nice. But yeah, I think I chose 4.5 because I wanted to have um, a little bit of the plane in focus and not have it fall off. But I didn't want everything. I didn't want to stop down because also one thing you have to think about is the brightness of my light tools. If I made an F8 for everything to be in focus, then my light tool would have to be super bright to, to be um, seen. So it's also understanding how bright your light tools are and how to work with that. So at 4.5, I was able to get the proper brightness of my flashlight to work with these tools. And that's just something I learned through experimenting. And also it was going to give me enough depth of field. Good question. How long Any are you others? in the picture? How long are you in 30, the picture to add your light paint? Sure. So 30 seconds. I took the full. So this is how it works. I'll, I'll kind of talk through this one. This is an interesting one because I didn't use the flash um, because I didn't want the flash to spill on the airplane. So I did another technique. Um, if you look, there's like a light bar on the bottom of the picture. It kind of is like a PVC pipe with a hole and parking paper cut onto it. Um, also, lightpaintingbrushes.com sells this tool, which is really awesome. You should check it out. It's, I think it's called the light painter or portrait painter. Um, what I did was I started at the model's head and worked my way down her body. So it's kind of like scanning her body. Instead of using the flash, because if I flashed her, the light would have spilled all over the place. So it was actually a two-person team. I had someone scan her, and then I started doing the the um, the, the leaves or the, the wings kind of behind her. And I want to give the idea of the fallen angel. But I did it for the whole 30 seconds of time. I could have put it on bulb. So that's one thing I could have done. I could have kept it on bulb and stopped it when I was done. Um, but I like a good, healthy challenge of doing it within 30 seconds. So, yes, so, I was there the whole time, but I was moving and I was moving slightly and, and no light hit me from anything but the moonlight behind me. So you are not looking for depth of field to compensate for extra light plus ambient. That's right. That's exactly what I read. Right. Um, let me look at the other one. So that one's 3.5. This one's 4.5. I'm kind of, instead of shooting completely wide open, I want to have a little bit of, I want to have a little bit of depth of field because I could be shooting at 2.8. Um, but I want to have a little bit of depth of field. And then also um, I want to be able to have my light tools be bright enough to be seen in the picture. Good questions. Any others? Well, there was one from before. Sure. One, um, you'll have to, I don't remember when this came in because it was on, off of YouTube. It said, what if you can't get to the spot during the day to do setup and you arrive at night? Any tips? Sure. So I recommend bringing, this happens to me often. So good question. Um, 
I recommend bringing a buddy always for safety because I feel like if you've been going to somewhere in the dark, you never know what could happen. It's always good to light paint or, or to go anywhere to do any type of photography with a buddy. Also tell people where you're going to be just in case something happens and you have no service. So that's like first off safety measures. Then if you're going to go at night, I recommend bringing a strong flashlight to be able to find your way and kind of work on your composition. So like in this place, I kind of use a flashlight to kind of see where I wanted to compose the shot. Like if you're just shooting the stars, it's different. You can use apps like photo pills um, um, to kind of see where the stars will align if you're trying to get the Milky Way. Or um, I just recommend bringing your flashlight and, and scouting it that way. Also, um, if you can scout ahead of time, if you know the exact location of where you want to go, you can use Google Maps. You can use um, Sun Surveyors, a really good app for seeing where, like Google Earth is also really good. These are all great tools. If you want to message me on Instagram, I can send you links on how to, um, what to use. Tell me a little bit more about your condition, but even Google Earth will help you align your pictures and show you where the stars will be at night. So it's actually super helpful. You can do a lot of research from your, your like living room before we even get there. So I recommend doing all that and then showing up at least with an idea in mind. Susan, how did you get the light guards waving behind the model? Was there someone waving it, but why weren't they visible a little bit? What are you talking about? Light guards, what do you mean? I'm, I'm asking- Oh, this one, I'm okay, here. so sorry, this one. Okay, sorry, so she's talking about this like tube, light guard, thank you. <laughs> I'm starting to figure out, I don't ever call it that, the tube. So how did I get the tube behind the model? Great question. There's some things that just seem innate to me because I do it all the time that some people are probably like, what happened? So here, if you look very carefully, I didn't Photoshop, Photoshop this out for a reason. You can see my shoes. Um, I don't know if I could zoom in on a PowerPoint presentation, but if you look over here, you can see my shoes. So what happened was here, I used this tube. It was, uh, wasn't quite bright enough. It was still kind of opaque. So I didn't move my feet for the duration of the exposure and light hit them. So that's why you're able to see my tubes. So basically I stand behind the tube and use the tube to block me typically. Um, occasionally I'll get, my feet will sneak in there. So you'll occasionally see my feet. So that is, I try to avoid that at all costs. But here I wanted to show you guys it does happen. So think about it as your light painting with the tube in front of you and you're making sure your feet don't stay in the same spot, even just like shifting them a little bit so they don't get burned into the picture. Uh, again, for that one, um, I think you can actually see my foot right there. I never looked that closely at these pictures, but you can see it a little bit right behind her leg. Um, but typically, this one, you don't see it. Typically, I try and hide. Even here, I'm moving around so much, you don't see me. And I like to wear black. I recommend wearing black so you blend in. If you wear white, white reflects the light back at the camera, and you might see yourself more, especially white tennis shoes. Those are the worst because they tend to catch a lot of light. Um, here I was moving a bit and also hiding behind her. And here, you, you didn't catch me at all. I'm amazing, I'm like a ninja in this one. Um, <laughs> but the, the moonlight was casting light from behind her. So this is actually something important. Whenever you go to shoot a model and there's ambient light like the moon or street light, I typically try and face them away from it because if they're staring at the light the whole time, and let's say it's 30 seconds or 10 seconds, if they move a little bit, they'll start to look like a monster <laughs> unless you flash them in and then you can freeze them. But still, like I like to point them away from the light and then use that backlight as a hair light or a rim light. So that's what I did here. And at the end of this one, I did a fort important when you light your model, not to light it from right behind the camera, just like when we're light painting landscapes, we do it at a 45 degree angle or even like 90 degrees, depending on how much shadow you want to create. And again, I just took that speed light, I put it at my model, and I did the circles. And one other thing, when do you do the flash the model? You know, I've gone back and forth, flashing her first, flashing her second. I've learned that the model actually is more prepared at the beginning of the photo, excuse the ambulance. Um, so I typically like to flash them at the beginning because they're giving me the better expression. Unless there's a reason to do it at the end. I mean, 
both are fine, but they normally look more prepared at the beginning. After like 10 seconds, their attention starts to span and then they're like not making the best face. So that's my tip for that. Any other questions? Keep moving on. Uh, here's an awesome place in New York City. It is in Central Park at the pond and it's an amazing place to get reflections. Uh, there's a bridge behind her and I had this gorgeous model. This is on one of my photo walks in Central Park. Uh, all I did was I went behind her with the light tube and I just did the circle and I did this kind of um, kind of like a chop. I chopped and, and went away from her. And we had the um, tripods and the camera set like across the lake and, and kind of compressed the shot, which I think was really effective. I chose 10 seconds here because it's actually there's a lot of ambient light. So I felt like 10 seconds in this part was kind of shadowy. It was good enough for her to hold the position. And also she's a dancer, so she knows how to hold positions well. If you ask me, I'm not a dancer. I can't hold a two second pose. So it's good to work with dancers because they're really, really know how to stand still. Susan. Yes. Um, there was a question about a picture that at Mono Lake asking yeah. where you put the light source. Going back to Mono Lake here. Okay. So you can actually see by the light spill of myself. <laughs> um, so I spilled the light on the ground. So you can kind of see I am at basically 90 degrees. Look at that shadow. So I'm at like 90 degrees shooting this front tufa. And then I actually don't have the right picture of the right flashlight. The flashlight I used here was called the Coast flashlight, Coast HP7. It has this great nozzle that you pull out and it focuses the beam very far. So that's why I was able to achieve this because it made it super narrow beam that went across the the lake and that actually was from the same position so basically i was at 90 degrees and you can see the casting of the light here and then i shot the far one again from across where exactly where it was with the hp7 coast flashlight focusing the beam from where i was standing now if i came prepared i could have set up a bunch of flashes and trigger them remotely or i could have set up a low level lighting tufa a, a low level light um, to face the tufa, you know, but that just required coming with some stands and some lights. And here I kind of was there for the first time and just had my flashlights with me. So there's a couple different ways to shoot this. Thank you. Good questions. Okay, moving forward. Susan, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. The circles around uh, behind the models if you're holding um, a torch with a tube on it, how do you get it in such a perfect circle? Because it looks amazing. Okay. So um, I could show you. Do I have a flashlight? So give me one sec. I have my flashlight here. No flashlights. All right. All right. So I don't have a flashlight readily available, but I do have a tube. So I will show you quickly. The way it works is the flashlights that I use all have pen clips built into them. Pretty important because what happens is when you have the tube, the pen clip goes straight into the, 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 the tube and holds it there. So it kind of just stays right there. I wish I knew where they were, but it kind of holds it like that in place. So then you're just kind of holding this one piece. If you buy a flashlight that doesn't have a pen clip, you can tape it around the rim of your tube. And this is a homemade tube, just to show you. I put some gels inside of it. So that's how this one works. So my technique of making a perfect circle is sticking my hand out and thinking like this has to be the exact same spot for the duration of the, the photo. So I start with my thumb facing down and my hand directly down, sorry, the computer's in the way. And I just spin it and I keep it like the center of a bicycle wheel. And if you keep your arm straight and your elbow doesn't bend and you keep your hand straight, sorry, it's so hard to do it here. I have a laptop in the way and, um, but you just kind of keep your hand straight and you spin it like this. 
and then you kind of release it so it finishes the circle, just make sure that the pivot point always stays the same. So you could put like a penny on the ground or something, or if you're doing it in front of someone's back, make sure it always stays right behind the center of their back. So it always stays the center. That's how you make the perfect circle. Just always make sure that okay. stent, your hand doesn't move or wobble. If it does this, it's going to look like a weird oval. <laughs> you don't want that, but it happens. Yeah, no, thank you. That's great. Thanks. I love these questions. Keep them coming. Okay, great. So uh, I do wet workshops in Mexico and I love the Day of the Dead. I wish I haven't been there yet for that celebration, but we hire models to do this Day of the Dead inspired shoot. And this is with a flashlight and a light tube. And um, I, I turned, this is a little bit of post-processing, but in order to make the red really come alive, I, I made the background a little bit blue. I deepened the blue of the background. But, and this one, I did a different type of effect. Instead of doing a circle, I did these little circles, miniature circles. And actually that's a much easier beginner's type of um, light painting because a circle is hard to master. Maybe you won't get it perfect every time, but these little circles um, are actually very easy to do. And, and then if they're not perfect, it's okay. And the important distinction is I actually did the light painting in front of her. So a lot of the ones you've seen so far has all been behind her. I want to teach you guys that you can make it three-dimensional by doing light painting in front of your subjects. And this is actually I had a boring background. I did a close-up of the model and, um, and did some side lighting and I was able to create an interesting background by doing the light painting tubes behind her and doing some side light. Like at a 45 degree angle, you could see how harsh it is. I really wanted to feature her makeup. Again, Susan. yeah. Uh, question. You yeah. said, I don't let the light spill onto me. How is that the case? Do you paint the back of the T8 tube? So I do have some uh, tubes that are painted, that have a, a piece of uh, tape that goes straight down the back, but then I also have some that aren't. So I've noticed that even when I do the ones that are solid, um, I don't, I make sure I paint in front of me. So that's an important distinction. I don't, um, I, I normally go all the way to the, the ground or I move my feet enough so the light isn't spilling on top of me. So because I'm putting myself behind the light, you don't see me. Like here again, the light was actually the tube. Um, you can see from this one, I moved all around the picture. I started from behind the camera and I did kind of, a, I call it the vacuuming. I vacuumed in front of, the model and then went around him, but you don't see me at all. And I sit behind him. What's helpful also is if your model or subject has a wider stance, like this guy had baggy pants. It's great if your model has a skirt because then you won't see your, your feet. If your model is wearing a mini skirt and has their legs separated, there's a chance that maybe you could see your feet at the bottom. So I just make sure to put the light source in between me and the model me and the camera and the model, just basically in front of me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I'm happy fine. to clarify it a little bit more. <laughs> but this one is, uh, again, using that three-dimensionality. And what I did here was I used the flashlight on strobe mode. So that's how I was able to get this beautiful pattern of light. Um, I recommend if you're gonna invest money, invest money in a good flashlight one that's a thousand lumen or more. It has a pen clip and it has strobe mode. Check out my website uh, for my gear guide. It's under education. It goes into light painting uh, or, or just email me for my light painting gear guide because I have all these cool tools that I've um, made or bought that I can share with you guys how I did it. I love light painting. This is like my passion. So happy to talk to anyone about it. So feel free to Instagram me. This is one where I use uh, steel wool. So steel wool, if you're not familiar, is like a Brillo pad. Um, they sell at the hardware store. This is like industrial uh, style steel wool. Uh, I use grade, I don't know, zero, 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 I guess was the one I used. But um, you put it inside a whisk, like a whisk that you'd make pancake batter with. And then you use like a dog leash or a rope and you tie that on the end of the whisk. I know guys, this is weird stuff. I didn't come up with it. 
I just copied someone else who did it and I thought, hey, that's cool. Let me try it. So you tie the whisk onto a rope and you light the steel wool that's inside the cage on fire and it'll just start to smolder. But only when you start spinning it does it do this really cool um, effect. Make sure you have a fire extinguisher nearby because we don't want to start any forest fires. Uh, and um, and just make sure you, you're using it with caution because uh, no photo is worth that anything is on fire. But this was like a, a cool usage of it. And also, so first thing I did here was I photographed the, I photographed for the Milky Way. I got my settings right for the Milky Way. And then I went and got the steel wool. One thing about using fire is that fire doesn't have a level of brightness. You can't just like dim it because it's too bright. Typically the fire will start off super bright and then dim as it starts to go out. So what I learned when I was doing this was I took my best pictures for proper exposure wise when the fire started to dim out because it wasn't as bright as it was when it started. So just some tips when you're gonna shoot fire. Um, yeah, you can't control the, the burn. So you gotta just kind of wait till it's the right, work with it basically. Shooting in the city is really exciting. There's lots of ambient light all over the place. But once in a while, you can find a dark corner. Uh, and this is uh, using the city as a backdrop. This is in Gantry State Park. Again, I use the dancer because dancers know how to stay still. I use the tubes. And I use, not only do I make my own tubes with the ones from Home Depot or Amazon, but I also now have invested in tubes from Eric Pere. Eric Pere is actually the founder of this type of light painting. It's called uh, Tube Tribe. And um, he's the one who was the first photographer to ever stick a flashlight in a tube and dance around with it. I don't know. I think so. But he kind of originated this and he now sells his own tubes, which are amazing. As you can see from the ones of these ones, they come with gels in them and they can be multicolored and they're just fantastic. So you can get his tubes at um, Tube Tribe or, or TubeLightPainting.com. Uh, I don't know. Message me. I'll, I'll send you the link. But his tubes are phenomenal. When you're ready to make the investment, check this out. Again, these are his tubes. Um, what I was looking at here was to create symmetry. So I want to explain this shot to you. It's a little complex. This is the same model and this is super dark conditions. We're in a botanical garden. There's no lights anywhere. So basically my model, which is my friend, this is a Saturday night for me. This is fun guys. So my friend is a yoga practicer. So she decides she's going to strike a pose. And what we do is we put it on bulb mode because there's no way I could do all these positions within six, 30 seconds. So I set my timer on bulb mode. I start the trigger. We walk to one position in the dark. She strikes her pose. I turn the flashlight on that's already in the tube. I do my circle. We turn it off. We both move to the next location, which is on this pedestal in the middle of this little moat or whatever. She strikes her pose. I turn it off. And then we went to the other side. She strikes her pose. I turned it off. And then meanwhile, I had this friend who had another tube and he kind of danced around on the top level. So for me, I think symmetry and uh, balance is really important in pictures. And I think that's how you get really interesting shots when you're creating. Like this picture was a blank scene and look at what we're able to create. So I didn't just take the photo, I made it. So that's hopefully you guys are getting that kind of theme when you look at these pictures. This is a picture of uh, this flow artist that I met and uh, the cool lighting effect is actually from an LED hula hoop. So, I mean, they put lights on everything. So you don't need to get fancy lighting equipment to do light painting. You could use your children's toys that light up. You could use Christmas lights. You can use um, an old um, glow stick that you have from uh, 4th of July or sparklers, you know, Basically, anything lights up, you can use it. Even your iPhone can create awesome light painting. And this is one of my favorites. Again, I use the fire, uh, which is that fiber optic with the red gel in it and the flashlight in it. And I just shook it. And I wanted to make my friend here look like a superhero. So what I did was I started off with a blank environment. You can tell that there's a light in the background. And I made sure not to face her towards it. And I also... She was a really careful positioning. I wanted her to look like she was where the alleyway converged. So even though you're shooting in the dark, composition still matters. 
So I composed it so she was right in the center of this V line. I had her posing and I pointed her towards the wall because I thought the wall would be better because it's darker, you'd see the fire better. And then I put the fire on the ground as well. And I did it all within 13 seconds. I know it's a lot. And I strobed her to light up her face because I didn't want her just to be a silhouette. Lastly, uh, this is another epic scene from a workshop I did in the Dolomites. Um, it was great. I could have just took the picture as is. You know, it was epic without having any light painting in it. But I wanted to make it my own. I wanted to add my own signature to it. And by having my friend pose on this mountaintop and doing like a little light painting tube circle around him, it's now signature. I don't know anyone else who has this picture. So, you know, I want you to walk away from this workshop thinking about how can I create unique images just by manipulating time. And it could be during the day using filters. It could be during blue hour where you're just using long exposures because that naturally happens. Or you can do it at night and incorporate your own light. Um, again, my name is Susan. I'm from Faux Tour Adventures. I have a special discount on my website uh, for all my upcoming workshops. Uh, it's Nisi is the code. If you bring a friend, you get an extra $100 discount. And here are my upcoming workshops. I'll be in New York City for the holidays. And uh, I'll be using my Nisi filters, doing some long exposures um, from Dumbo and from the World Trade Center. So come join me if you want to learn how to use your filters get some for the holidays, ask Santa for some. And then I'll be doing some night photography in the Alabama Hills and Trona. Um, I'll be back at that ghost town with that awesome plane crash in Nevada, doing light painting portraits, back in Mexico, doing some cultural pictures and, and really drinking lots of margaritas, not gonna lie. Uh, the dunes of Death Valley are always spectacular. Back to the mountains for the Dolomites, off to the safari in South Africa, and this year I'll be going to Nepal to do some um, amazing mountain views and helping some local communities and then off to Sedona. So I do a lot of workshops. I'd love for you guys to join me or just even share with me your photos that you create with uh, manipulating time and using filters or just, just you know, really experimenting. I hopefully you guys uh, piqued your interest to do something a little bit different. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I know that was a lot. Susan. Yes. I have a question. Yes. What was the name of that Explorer RGB light that you use? The one made by I, Explorer? Yes, actually. I don't know this one, but I'm going to start using it. <laughs> <laughs> I kept hearing that name over and over again. We have so many products. We have so many products in our line that are even the people that represent us don't know everything we have. Sure, sure. So one yes, these, I need to check out one of these your LED light. Your way to try out and see how it compares. Okay, <laughs> perfect. I look forward to that uh, this 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 holiday season. I'll be trying it out. Cool. Also. You know how long I was waiting to do that? Anyway, turn off the turn on. <laughs> Thank you. Also, yeah, no, um, it looks awesome. I love to try it out. It's it's you know what? There's a few advantages to it in the way it's built and everything like that. It's just another me too item that we have. Um, you'll try it and you'll see if you like it. If you what's the other one called? It's a Luxley. A Luxley is the brand. They have a bunch like a fiddle and a viola. So it's I think it's um, a Mac group brand, to be honest, well, something like uh, that. We'll see. We'll let you do a comparison and tell us. Yeah, I'd love to try it out. And I've been loving my Explorer tripod. So uh, it's become a new uh, a new tool with me that comes on all my adventures. And of course, I use the filters all the time. Um, so, yeah, I can't wait to every time it's cloudy. I'm like, let's take filters out and create long exposures. It's just like my favorite thing to do is to see something that's moving, like manipulate the the clouds and everything. So, and uh, just oh. capture that motion. Okay. So someone is uh, asking what the discount code again is. Uh, it is Nisi, but message me uh, and I will message me on the one you want. Email me at Susan. I'll put it in at Photor Adventures and I'll make sure uh, you get the discount. 
Okay, got it. Some of them are already live. I already just actually discounted all the photo walks um, for the all the New York City photo walks. I'm so excited to lead people on these photo walks around New York City, especially with the holidays. We can do long exposures. And then also, um, I'm really getting into doing like the sunset and sunrises. So we can bust out your filters and get some good motion with them. And speaking of coupons, we have our own coupons for prop from Nisi and Explorer product, including our RGB light. And um, I also am going to just touch real back real quick on the variable ND. Uh, mm -hmm. You had mentioned your uh, that you're not you haven't been very satisfied with the variable ND. I've never used one. I've only seen my students show up with them. So I'd love to actually check out yours. Um, because the ones that they get, I don't think they're getting the best quality one. So I think yeah. that's kind of a, a situation. Well, if I can just tell our audience real quick that our variable ND has eliminated the problem of the um, of the expanding because, uh, mm. well, we have, we'll just say that we have. And also we're very color neutral. So the only, the only thing that's remaining about a variable ND that's not, that, that a that a a fixed ND is still better, is that in very very long exposures, uh, a fixed ND will keep the color uh, more more neutral, more natural to what it actually is. And a variable, even though our variable is highly highly corrected, more so than virtually any other one out there, uh, you still get a better result with a fit with a fixed ND, but. If a, if a variable is more convenient for you or you feel it's more economical for you, you'll really like our variable ND. It's really, really great. Cool. And um, I guess, let's see. Um, I think we kind of have that. The only question that I kind of went over came in at the end, Roseanne had asked, so that F4 is the image sharp all the way through. Well, to be honest, it's mostly about the light painting and I wasn't that far from my my background. So I think yes, because I feel like when you're doing light painting, if you're a subject and you're light painting or focus that you're you're in great shape. So I feel like um, I, I actually don't ever shoot with anything more than like a 4.5 f-stop typically when I'm doing my light painting. So I feel like it's it's suited me well. If you have a really detailed, complex background, maybe you might want to explore something more. But um, yeah, it actually served me quite well. Cool. So yeah, if anyone gets one of these filters, hopefully you guys put it on your holiday list. If anyone gets a, a new Nisi long exposure kit for Christmas and you don't know how to work it, let me know. I'll, I'll be Santa's little helper and come teach you how to use it. That's fantastic. All right. Well, then um, I think we're going to call it a night, Susan. Thank you so much. Fantastic Thank presentation. You. If you're looking at the chats, you're seeing all these people telling telling you how uh, incredible your images are. And they truly ah, are. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So, and thank you for hanging in there. I appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to seeing all your creative work. Shoot me an email on Instagram or whatever. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. This has been a wonderful opportunity. Great. Good night, all. I'll be in touch with you tomorrow. Sounds great. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.